Good evening, I'm Dr. Michelle Larson, President and CEO of the Adler Planetarium. Welcome to our virtual celestial ball pre-party. If it were pre-pandemic, we'd be gathered at our beautiful historic building, watching the sunset behind the Chicago skyline. This year, we'll have to look up individually under the sky we all share. We'll connect differently, but most importantly, we've gathered to connect. Enjoy this time before the pre-program, converse with our staff on the chat, prepare yourself a signature cocktail using the recipe we shared, do some celestial inspired artwork or tell constellation stories amongst your family and friends. On behalf of the entire Adler team, we're delighted to welcome you to the first ever virtual celestial ball. We thank you for being here and we'll see you again during the program. This visualization was created for the Other Planetarium's exhibit gallery, The Universe, A Walk Through Space and Time. It describes a key phase in the early universe, the formation of the very first stars. Because the chemistry of the early universe was different, the stars that it created were different as well. These first stars were giant, living very short lives and exploding in tremendous supernovae. It was these supernovae that seeded the universe with the material needed to create subsequent generations of stars, and eventually our sun and our solar system. This video was awarded best visualization in the XSEED Supercomputing Conference of 2013. We begin our journey right here in Illinois, above the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, a place where they study the very smallest objects in the universe. Incredibly, the properties of these very small objects determines the structure of our universe on the very largest of scales. So as we fly past the moon and out through the solar system and among the stars, of our Milky Way galaxy, we'll begin to experience the hierarchy of the universe. Eventually, traveling among the galaxies themselves, this is a map of a million galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. You see clusters and superclusters of galaxies strung together in what we call the cosmic web. These patterns are imprinted in the very early universe by the nature of those very tiny particles that are studied at Fermilab. This Adler Planetarium visualization illustrates Earth's changing climate. Shown here are rays of sunlight reaching Earth. Some of this light is reflected, the rest is absorbed and then radiated back into space as heat. Every day, Earth-orbiting satellites record the reflected sunlight, called shortwave radiation, and the emitted heat energy, called longwave radiation. The amount of energy coming in just about equals the amount of energy going out. We call this the Earth's energy budget. This view centers on Earth, as our planet revolves around the sun each year. The chart shows global temperature compared to the average since 1880. With increasing amounts of heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere, less heat energy escapes into space. The balance has been altered.
Hi friends, I'm Sarah. I'm going to lead you in a fun, easy activity that you can do along with me. Let's double check your supplies so that you can be sure that you have everything you need. First, some thick paper. Black or dark blue is ideal, but anything will do. Pencil, hole punch. If you don't have the hole punch, no worries. And if you'd like, some markers. This program was inspired by our Atwood Sphere and by all the personal stories that people have told looking up. Throughout history, people have seen stories when they looked up at the star-speckled sky. These images sparked their imagination and inspired them to use the sky to tell their stories. Using your imagination, can you make your own star story? What story does your sky tell? Let's create our star stories. Make yours along with me as I make mine. First, I'm going to draw out the shape that I want with a pencil. I'll mark where the stars will go. Next, I'll use the hole punch or pencil to punch out the stars. Then, when I hold it up to the light, the story will shine through onto the wall. When your whole family has finished, take turns showing and telling about your star story. Mine is about a bunny that jumped so high, she landed in the stars. You can create enough star stories to fill a whole sky, just like all the constellations in the real night sky. Thanks for sharing your stories with us on social media. We can't wait to see what you've made. Be sure to use the hashtag AdlerSeaBall. That's all for me tonight. We hope you're enjoying this year's Sea Ball, and we can't wait to be back at the Adler with you. This video illustrates the process that goes into making one of the visualizations for the other planetarium sky shows. On the left, you see the raw data from a simulation showing the formation of the Earth-Moon system. And on the right, you see the final scene as rendered for the show, Imagine the Moon. One of the amazing things about modern telescopes is just how tiny an object they can observe. So we're going to zoom in now. We're going to zoom in by a factor of almost half a million in angular scale. We're zooming in on an area between the horns of Taurus the Bull, and this is a star forming region. As we get closer, that black square is an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And we're going to zoom into a special star, HL Tau. But to see inside, to see what's going on in that star, we need to zoom further and use a different kind of light. So this is using a, an array of radio telescopes in the Atacama Desert in Chile called ALMA. And that lets us zoom into a tiny, tiny image. Just one second of arc on the side. 
And here we see a disk around a newly formed star and we see gaps where planets are forming. the next 90 years my mind kind of goes wild. There's so many different things that I hope for and I hope that I will even still be alive to see. But one of them is really the next five years and I hope to see a woman and a heck of a lot more diversity on the moon and in space travel. The other thing that I start to think about are all the unknown parts of the universe that are yet to be explored and our ability to travel and get to them as well as see to those. And I'm super excited to think about the chance that we might be able to achieve travel that's even a tenth of the speed of light or anything close to space travel that would get us further away from where we know our own galaxy to be. Hello Adler Planetarium, my name is John Carmichael, I'm an astrophotographer and I wanted to congratulate all of you on a 90th anniversary. That is truly impressive, the first planetarium in the United States. If it wasn't for planetariums, I wouldn't have been as awestruck and inspired about astronomy as I was at a young age, and I wouldn't be where I am in my life. And I think space is so important because not only does it instill curiosity, but it's a constant reminder that we're all a part of something so much larger than ourselves. And that humbles us, and that humility is what actually unites us, and it's what we really need in the world right now. And not only that, but it, it also gives us a, a future to look forward to, and it gives us a sense of purpose. I mean, imagine the things we're going to be discovering 90 years from today about our own solar system, let alone the rest of the universe, right? And I have no doubt that Adler's going to still be a part of it 90 years from today, presenting those new discoveries in creative ways to inspire countless generations to come. So congratulations again, and thank you all for everything you do, and uh, here's to another 90 years. My hope is to see more sustainability and a copacetic relationship between Earth and our universe. I think it's important to continue to build a platform to share research, inventions, knowledge, and inspiration with generations to come. Throughout the next 90 years and beyond, I'm hopeful that the people in our world creating bodies of work in the fields of science, technology, engineering, art, and math will combine their unique abilities and work together to collaborate beyond anything that could ever be imagined in our world today. This visualization is taken from the Other Planetarium Sky Show, Planet Nine. And what it's showing is the discovery of new objects in the distant reaches of the solar system, out beyond the orbit of Neptune. The first such object was discovered in 1992 by Dave Jewett and Jane Liu. And after that discovery, there were many, many more. There are now thousands of objects in this region we now call the Kuiper Belt. These objects have similar orbits to the previous planet Pluto. And the existence of some objects out there who are almost as large as Pluto was what led to, more than a decade ago, Pluto being reclassified as a dwarf planet. You're watching a test projection of astrographics. 
an Adler Planetarium production for Art on the Mart. Art on the Mart is the world's largest permanent digital art projection. It spans two and a half acres on the facade of the Merchandise Mart on the Chicago Riverfront. This piece is a combination of visualizations and imagery from the Adler's collections. It was scheduled to have run during the summer. However, due to the pandemic, um, that opening has been delayed. It's a 16 minute piece that takes us from the earth to the edges of our universe. The piece also features music from the great Chicago jazz musician Sun Ra, and that music was in part curated by the Experimental Sound Studio in Chicago. We hope you'll be able to watch it when it does open, either this fall or next year, depending on conditions. Now, if you look at the role that the Adler has played in the last 90 years, it has been to make science, space science in particular, accessible, available to all sections of humanity, regardless of age, regardless of demographics, regardless of affluence, regardless of where you live or were born. Uh, and it was, it, was, it was an open field for the whole world to come in and learn and explore and discover and spark curiosity around space science. So that mission actually gets even more amplified over the next 90 years as this huge divergence and advancement in science and computing uh, takes us to places that we cannot even imagine today. In times of crisis, often uh, you look back and it's in a time of incredible opportunity. And so we're at an amazing time in the world as the Adler celebrates its 90th birthday. And when you think about what the next 90 years could come, I think about it in a couple of ways. One, as I think about STEM and STEM education, I really believe we'll be on equal footing. No longer will we wonder why women and young girls aren't interested in contributing to STEM at the same rate as men. I think the Adler will have a, a rich, diverse programming, digital in nature, reaching more than just Chicagoland, but the world as everyone looks up. As we contemplate the Adler's future, I'm reminded of astronaut Neil Armstrong's incredibly insightful observation that science has not yet mastered prophecy. We predict too much for the next year, and yet far too little for the next 10. With that caveat in mind, I'm very excited that technology and new business models are making space travel safer and more accessible, sparking renewed interest among Earthlings about what's out there and how to get there. The timing couldn't be better as that newfound excitement will intersect with the work of today's amazing Team Adder, who are creating a true 21st century museum stretching from Chicago's lakefront to the farthest reaches of the world, helping citizens of this planet understand space science while realizing they can indeed do science. While Neil Armstrong is right that we can't predict the future with accuracy, it's clear that the Adder, at 90 years young, is entering the most exciting chapter of its life. It's unfortunate that COVID has forced all of us into thinking in new ways. But yet again, in this adversity, lie the seeds of an important opportunity for Adler. And I see Adler and the resources and the people that we have and our experience with human efforts to explore the universe as such an important gem and important piece that this should be shared with the entire world. And if this transition of Adler to a new global virtual Adler can allow the whole of humanity and the next generation to share in this gem, why not?
This simulation by other astronomer Aaron Geller shows what happens over the lifetime of a star cluster. In this case, we're simulating the Pleiades. Over 100 million years, stars evolve, the most massive evolved fastest, exploding as supernova and becoming black holes, the green spirals you see here. The next most massive take a little longer and end their lives also in supernova explosions, but as neutron stars, the orange dots. And in those explosions, they're ejected sometimes at incredible speeds, being ejected clear out of our Milky Way galaxy. As we zoom in closer, we'll see that the cluster is disrupted in other ways. The tide of our galaxy pulls that cluster apart. And then inside the galaxy, interactions between stars can cause changes as well. Here we're going to zoom in and watch these two white stars come together to eject the red star out of the cluster. And you can watch the complicated multi-body dance of these cluster stars. What you're watching is a simulation of the formation of the universe. 13.8 billion years going past in just one minute of time. In this simulation, you see that it's dark matter that forms the backbone of the universe, pulling material together into a shape we call the cosmic web. In the bright knots where the blue glow is, you'll see where clusters of galaxies form and light up the universe. This projection is a 360 degree view meant to be wrapped around you. The kind of immersive view that you would get in the Adler's Granger Planetarium. One of the main ways people have always been connected to the sky is by marking the passage of time using sundials. The Adler Planetarium holds a collection that tells the story of looking to the sky. The collection includes this sundial, made in Germany about 200 years ago. Now it may not look like any sundial you've seen before, but this strange cube-shaped object includes many sundials. We can use visualization to understand how it works. From this angle, we can see how shadows move through the day. As we move to another side, we can see how the shadow continues to move. As we approach 3 p.m. and then 4 p.m. With this visualization, we bring together centuries-old tools and cutting-edge technology to illustrate our enduring connection with our shared sky above. I envision a future where the Adler serves as a hub for fostering the potential of humanity. Potential that is fueled by curiosity, anchored in science and solid reasoning, and inclusive of different life paths and perspectives. We are connected under the sky we all share on this single planet that we inhabit. The future is ours to realize together. Well, I hope the Adler Planetarium is one of the significant spots in Chicago that is able to talk to a lot of the young people as they come through like they did me and uh, to learn a lot about the, uh, the, the sky, the stars, uh, uh, and, uh, and also and take it to the ground so they could also learn something about our space activities, our programs. Uh, my Gemini 7 spacecraft is there now and uh, they can learn more about what our future is going to be like. 
I think there's a lot more to our space activities than that I went through. And of course, in, after I'm long gone. And so the space uh, Adler is not only just an institution to teach about uh, the, uh, uh, the, the sky, uh, but also the problems from the earth to the sky. And uh, it will be a, a, an overall educational system that we can teach a lot of young children here in Chicago. Hey Stargazers, welcome to the 2020 Celestial Ball edition of Skywatch Weekly. My name is Nick, I'm a theaters manager at the Adler Planetarium, and I'm a little bit more dressed up than normal for this very exciting night. I wanted to give you a quick overview of what celestial sights you can expect to see in the sky tonight, and we'll also hear from a very special guest. Well, tonight is a classic combination of summer and fall skies, my personal favorite time of the year to be stargazing. Thrown in this year are some lovely planets, including bright Jupiter and Saturn in the south. They're right near the teapot pattern in the constellation of Sagittarius, the archer. And these planets are easily seen with the naked eye in Chicago. A beautiful sight to see if you can get away from the city lights is the Milky Way. This beautiful band of light puts on its best show for us in the northern hemisphere at this time of the year. Stretching from the south all the way to the north in the evening sky, it's a glorious sight, and one that is especially good this week as the moon approaches its new phase on Thursday. So no light pollution from the moon, and if you can get away from the city pollution, on a clear night it is a breathtaking view to behold. Straight up in the sky you have the Summer Triangle, a very bright pattern of stars to look for, and easily seen in Chicago. More towards the north we have the well-known zigzag W shape of Cassiopeia rising up, after spending most of the summer pretty low in the evening sky, now earlier on in the evening, starting to rise up in the northeast. Below her, the constellation of Perseus the Hero. This was the radiant for the beautiful Perseid meteor shower that I hope you had a chance to catch a month ago. Also off to the east here, you can see Mars rising before 9 p.m. It's gonna be getting brighter and brighter over the next month and also rising earlier and earlier. So definitely give that a look as well. Well, getting to know the skies is a rewarding experience, but actually getting to venture beyond our home planet and explore space is not something many of us have done, at least so far. I'm excited now to hear from one of those lucky few who has gone to space and navigated the celestial seas, Captain James Lovell. Captain Lovell, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Nick. There was one incident uh, that we had to use, and it wasn't the stars, actually, it was the sun. We weren't too sure that the guidance system was correctly uh, done correctly when we moved from the command module, which was dying, into the lunar module. So what we did was we went into the computer system of the lunar module and we said, point the optics at the sun. And so then we wanted to see if the guidance system would then take the spacecraft and move it around uh, and then point the optics up to the sun. And so as we put that information into the guidance system, 
And then we looked at the optics and the spacecraft started to move, started to go, and we watched the optics go into the sky, into the sky past the stars, and then suddenly we saw the sun slowly drift into the center of the optics. And then we knew that our gain system was correct. Then that we were really on course and we didn't have to worry about it. Stars uh, seems a lot closer to me uh, than maybe a lot of people because uh, I've used them as friends to go to the moon and back and therefore uh, they, they, I seem to like them or we're or, or closer together. Welcome to this year's Celestial Ball. I'm pleased to introduce our host for the evening, the Adler Planetarium's president and CEO, Michelle Larson. Thank you, Captain Lovell. We're delighted you could be with us tonight. It was back in April, soon after the museum had closed and we were navigating unprecedented challenges that I received a call from Captain Lovell. It was around the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 13 tragedy and ultimate triumph. And Jim shared with me that that mission was successful because they had a combination of leadership, teamwork, and initiative. Well, tonight is a celestial ball like none before, and the museum is facing hard times like never before. But we'll get through with teamwork and initiative. Captain Lovell taught me that. And it's the teamwork of our Adler staff, our women's board and our trustees that bring you tonight's event. We are beginning a new chapter as we celebrate our 90th anniversary, and we look forward to the next 90 years. Welcome to Celestial Ball 2020. We are delighted to be serving our mission and sharing that with you, our community. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce our event chairs, co-chairs, Carrie Shunyang and Claire York, and Women's Board President, Caroline Becker-Joss. Good evening. Thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. It is my pleasure to be one of the co-chairs of the 26th Annual Celestial Ball and our first ever digital gala presented by Adler Planetarium's Women's Board. We're so pleased you could be here. That's right, Carrie. We're so pleased that all of you could be here tonight. This evening's program is about highlighting the ways in which the Adler is reinventing itself to fulfill its mission in new and exciting ways, especially during these challenging times. Throughout the evening, we encourage all of our guests to donate to Adler's mission, to ensure that our programs like Skywatch Weekly and one of my favorites, our teen intern program, continue to educate and inspire. Our giving is open throughout the evening at adlerplanetarium.org slash celestial ball. And I encourage everyone to give what you can. This year, the Adler is celebrating its 90th anniversary through a great depression, a world war, and times of immense social change. The Adler has stood as a shining beacon of exploration, discovery, and hope for Chicago and the world beyond. Now, as we look forward to the next 90 years, to the challenges and successes yet to come, we're grateful to all of you for supporting the Adler and its mission in this time of great need. The Adler is particularly grateful in these times for the immense leadership of our Board of Trustees. I am proud to introduce my fellow trustee and board chair, Linda Jojo, to present this evening's Corporate Partner Award. Thank you, Caroline. Two years ago, as I sat in the audience, as we celebrated Captain Lovell's 90th birthday, I wondered how he would make the Adler's own 90th birthday something unique and special. Well, I think we have. For one, it was great to see Captain Lovell a few minutes ago. But more importantly, it's great to see how the Adler and everyone associated with it has pivoted in these challenging times to create a unique and special experience. Two years ago, who would have imagined that this year's event would have come as our beloved planetarium would have been closed to guests for nearly six months? Or that this event would be virtual? Well, no one, of course. But none of us would be surprised to hear how the Adler has responded to this adversity. Thanks to Michelle's leadership and with tremendous focus and commitment from her talented team at the Adler and my incredibly dedicated colleagues on the Board of Trustees, the Adler is in the early stages of what I think is a historic pivot, a true digital transformation. Tonight's successful virtual celestial ball is just the beginning of their ideas. And as difficult as these times are, 
I'm excited about what the future holds for our institution. That future is more secure thanks to our incredible corporate partners. I'm honored to introduce the 2020 Celestia Ball Corporate Partner Award honoree, Bank of America. The first footprint on the moon, the first hundred feet of a marathon, or the first dollar saved toward a new home or business venture. Bank of America knows that giant leaps and incredible accomplishments begin with a single step. Guided by its mission to make financial lives better through the power of every connection, Bank of America partners with thousands of local nonprofits and has invested billions around the world, helping support local economies and taking steps towards stronger, more inclusive communities. With their recent four-year, $1 billion pledge, they have committed to advancing racial equality and economic opportunity and creating opportunities for communities of color. Bank of America's values echo those of our founder, Max Adler, who envisioned a new community where all people could gather together and experience the wonder of our universe. For over 20 years, Bank of America's partnership with the Adler has changed lives, helping teens launch high-altitude balloons, paving the way for education hubs and engaging family days, and fueling inspiring moments of insight in exhibitions like our newest, Chicago's Night Sky. With support from Bank of America, we are proud to celebrate the last 90 years and confident as we take our first steps towards the next 90. Congratulations to Bank of America, the recipient of the Adler Planetarium's 2020 Corporate Partner Award. Bank of America's commitment to the Chicagoland community and to communities across the country embodies the Adler Planetarium's spirit of connection. Thank you to Bank of America for their generous support this evening and congratulations on this year's Celestial Ball Corporate Honoree Award. Here to accept the award on behalf of Bank of America is Paul Lambert, Chicago Market President. I'm Paul Lambert, Bank of America Chicago Market President. And I'm thrilled to join you tonight to celebrate 90 years of Adler Planetarium encouraging us to look to the sky and realize no matter who, what, or where we are, there's something universal that binds us all together. It's been a privilege to partner with Adler for decades through educational programs, exhibits, and our Museums on Us free admission program. On behalf of Bank of America, our 6,000 Chicagoland colleagues, and board director Raj Bhatia. It's our honor to accept this year's Corporate Honoree of the Year Award. Thank you, and keep looking up. Thank you, Paul, and congratulations again to Bank of America for being our 2020 Corporate Partner Award. We are stronger because of your long partnership, and we look forward to many years ahead. It is now my pleasure to introduce our Adler Collections team, Dr. Pedro Raposo, Chris Helms, and Jessica Brody Frank. Thank you, Michelle. Nine years ago, the Adler Planetarium became the first institution of its kind in the Western Hemisphere. In his inauguration speech, our founder and benefactor, Mr. Max Adler, remarked that under the heavens, everything is interrelated as each of us to the other. From day one, with our collections, we've shown to millions of visitors how people through the ages all over the world have sought to understand the universe and engage with the sky. Be it a 17th century Italian telescope, one of the oldest to survive, a medieval astrolabe from the Middle East, a celestial globe from China, or a 19th century sundial from Japan, all of these artifacts, just to name a few, testify to the skill, ingenuity, and creativity of diverse people in their own journeys of exploration. By preserving these artifacts and sharing their stories with Chicago, the country, and the world, we will continue to inspire people of all ages, origins, walks of life to participate in this great human adventure that binds us all together, the exploration of our amazing universe. Well said, Pedro. In addition to using our objects to tell engaging stories and to educate the public, the Adler has an obligation to care for our objects to make them safe for future generations. 
As the collections manager, it is my job to make sure that all of these objects, roughly 6,000 objects and rare books, are cared for like this 18th century orrery here next to me. We work really hard with our engineering and building management departments to make sure that all of our systems in the building are up and running in the proper way and that our objects are safe and sound. Now over to Jessica to talk about some of our digital engagement efforts. Thanks, Chris and Pedro. Hi, everybody. My name is Jessica Brody frank I'm the Digital Collections Access Manager here at the Adler Planetarium. As you just saw, we still have our thousands of amazing collection objects on site. And even though you can't get to them right now, you can see them virtually through a lot of our really great digital offerings. So I'm going to show you some of the ways you can still interact and view some of these objects online. So the Adler Planetarium website actually has this great online resources landing page. From here, you can find a lot of things non-collections related even. So we have some of our podcasts, our Skywatch Weekly, but what I want to highlight here is some of our collections objects. So you can go on these virtual exhibitions and it'll bring you to our Google Arts and Culture page. Here right now we have 15 standing exhibitions that range from cultural astronomy, talking about Latino and Latina women and men in space science, uh, stories with Captain Lovell, if you want to hear a little bit more from him, as well as on you know some of our planets and our objects. If you go a little bit further, you can see Zooniverse, and we actually have a project on Zooniverse called Mapping Historic Skies. And here you can help us go through a lot of our uh, constellation objects. We have over 5,000 constellation depictions, and we're trying to make a database, and you can help us. So you can come in and actually help us mark out some of these constellations, and then in a different workflow, you can help us identify what those are. And if you scan down just a little bit further, you can actually see some of the images from that project we've turned into a coloring book for you. So if you're a little bit more artistic, we have some of these objects now turned into a coloring book. Another way to see some of our collections objects with our experts is actually through Adler Astronomy Live. So you can actually access this through YouTube, see some old episodes, and then Every two weeks, you'll get a new episode. About once a month, we feature collections objects. To learn more about our upcoming exhibits, interactive experiences, or other collections-related content, be sure to check us out on social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So back to you, Michelle. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you to the entire team for continuing to care for our historic collection and for finding ways to bring that collection to the world during these digital times. It is now my great pleasure to introduce an interview between Dr. Renee Horton, Adler teen intern, Maddie Williams, and Adler astronomer, Dr. Lucianne Walkowicz. Thank you, Michelle. I am Dr. Lucianne Walkowicz, one of the Adler Planetarium's astronomers, and I'm joined by Adler teen intern, Maddie Williams. Maddie's internship this summer focused on citizen science and science communication as part of the Adler Zooniverse program, the world's largest online citizen science platform. On behalf of Maddie and the entire Adler Planetarium, I'm excited to welcome Dr. K. Renee Horton to our program this evening. Dr. Horton currently serves as the Space Launch Systems Quality Engineer in the NASA Residential Management Office at Rishu Assembly Facility in New Orleans. She's a fellow and former president of the National Society of Black Physicists, and in 2011 was the first African American to graduate with a PhD in material science and a concentration in physics from the University of Alabama. Welcome to Dr. Horton. Hello, Maddie. It is actually great to be here with you today, and I cannot wait to do this interview with you. How did you first um, become involved with NASA? As a graduate student. So um, I, after doing my undergrad, I was working on uh, nanoparticles and magnetism, and it was on a NASA graduate student research uh, proposal. Um, and with that, it allowed me to be able to do my research at the university during the semester. And then during the summer, I would go over to the, to the NASA facility and work with the mentors there. And so I was able to travel out to Goddard and work with uh, mentors out in Goddard. And then I switched to the Harriet Jenkins um, fellowship, which was the last fellowship I was on um, for NASA. And it, it gave us the same privileges. And so I ended up in Huntsville then with that one. And my mentor, the work that I did became my PhD. Uh, Dr. Horton, uh, you're, you're speaking about these wonderful research opportunities that you had. And, um, you know, I know uh, Maddie has a whole lot of questions for you, but I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about 
um, how you came across those opportunities um, as a young person working in, in science. So both of those opportunities, well, the first one led to the second one, but the very first one was actually introduced when I had gone to the National Society of Black Physicists Conference, and there was a recruiter there, and they were talking about the fellowships that NASA had to be able to recruit minorities, uh, minorities and women. And so I applied for the, I wrote a proposal uh, and applied and was granted, and my proposal was approved. And then while I was in that program, they sent you to these uh, networking meetings every uh, every year, like at the conclusion of the program, so mostly in the summer. And so you would go to these networking meetings and at the networking meetings, there would be others there talking about other opportunities with NASA. And so I learned about the Harriet G. Jenkins um, Fellowship there as well. And the catch was people were saying, well, I don't know anybody who's ever had both of them. And I was like, well, we about to find out today. And so I applied for the Harriet G. Jenkins. And at the time she was actually still alive. And we would go um, to the meetings every at the end of your session in the summer and you would get to meet her. So you would get to sit with the fireside, chat with her and actually talk with her. And so it was the first time I had ever had a fellowship named after someone who was still alive. So those opportunities are just like out there. You've done a really good thing um, just at the fact that you've served as an intern. There are going to be fellowships that are going to be offered directly, ended up directly to you or that you qualify for and your friends don't qualify for once you go to college, just simply because you have this experience. Man. Could you tell us um, about your books that you've written? What my normal mission is, is about making sure people see me so that they can see that people look like me do science. For kids who don't look like me, they're looking and saying, oh, one day I could be working with someone who doesn't look like me, but they could be just as amazing as Dr. H, right? So that's what the book holds for us now. And so there are so many places I can't be, but the book can be. So we started off with three stories. Um, we brought on an award-winning teacher out of New Mexico and she has helped us develop and so now we have a develop we have nine in the series total and then there's a second series that starts discovering things like the lab um planet earth because we're here on earth and magnetism and electricity um and those kind of things when you were fresh out of high school or going into college did you know that you wanted to be um an engineer did you know you wanted to work at nasa yeah, so I, it was a, this is where my story gets a little tricky at. Um, I graduated at 16 and started and had gone off to college. And at 17, I was in the Air Force ROTC and they had sent me to get my physical. And at that time I learned I was hearing impaired in both ears. Um, and I did not qualify for the route that I was taking. I wanted to go to NASA and become an astronaut. Um, and my big dream was I was going to become a pilot first and then go in and apply for astronaut school. And so at 17, I actually found out that I did not qualify for my dream job or for what I wanted to do or the only thing I had really been talking about um, growing up. I knew I wanted to be a scientist because like whenever we play imaginary, like you see me back there with my coat on. That was always the way we talked about it. Like, yeah, you're a scientist. And I had a monkey and a lab coat and a beaker, you know, and all those great things when we did imagination together. The catch was when it was time for me to make a decision on what I wanted to do when I got to college, my dad said to me, I don't know any black engineers. No, I'm sorry, I don't know any black scientists is what he said. He says, but I know black engineers. I think you should do engineering. So I went engineering. Yeah, that's really amazing. Um when you found out that you were hearing impaired, how did you keep pushing yourself forward to become a scientist and an engineer? See, that's the catch I didn't in the beginning. So I went back to school 10 years later. Um, mm -hmm. And in that 10 years, I just kind of pretended I didn't have the problem. Um, and the problem just kept steadily getting worse and worse. Um, and it was getting the best of me. Uh, so for about 10 years, I didn't take control of it or try to um, even pursue what I thought was my big dream or what was lying inside of me, which was science, right? Um, I did DA photography, so the Department of Army, I was a photographer for them, one of their official photographers while we were overseas. And then when we moved back, I worked um, in our PX on the uh, military base. Um, it's stocking and as a clerk, and then I went worked at Sears as a photographer. 
Um, and then at about that time, I decided I really wanted to go back to school. So I started going back to school in South Carolina and started doing uh, actually astronomy, um, what I was majoring in then. And then once we moved and divorced, I came back home to Louisiana. And it was then that I realized I just wasn't living up to my full potential. So when my daughter was born is what kind of triggered the, you're not living to your full potential for me. So you said you wanted to show these kids that there are scientists that look like them and there's scientists that look like someone they wouldn't expect. Um, so do you have any advice for future black scientists, future female scientists? Yeah, if you want it, go after it. I don't, I, I just think, you know, for me, there were very few when I first started off and that now, like a large base of my friends are, are scientists or engineers. And so it's kind of weird when people say, well, I don't know a black, another black physicist but you. And I go, well, I know 12, you know, or 15 that I can call. So I'm always kind of like, but wait, I, I do know that. I wish that for every child, um, whether they're boy or girl, man or woman, black or white, that what, if their dream is to be in science, then they go for it. You know, I want to tell those that aren't um, black that when you do go for it, be kind enough to be an ally for somebody else who may not get the same opportunities as you and may not open the door. You know, it's one thing for you to have a seat at the table. It's another thing for you to have a seat at the table and close the door. That's what we don't want. We want you to have a seat at the table, leave the door open, and maybe even slide a step stool or something up for somebody else to slip in and be at the table. See, that's the part that's the important part. So that's my thing I wanna tell uh, the future scientists and engineers is that it's not just about you walking through the door, it's about you walking through the door and others being able to walk through the door and join you at the table as well. What do you think people, scientists could do now to make STEM a more inclusive field? You know, a lot of times we focus on diversity because that's the easy one, right? You can put like, this is a very diverse group right here. Um, and we could say, we could easily write it up in the summary and say, well, we have a very diverse group. You know, there were older ones, there were younger ones, there were white ones, there were black ones. Um, if you broke it down into other, you know, other things, you could definitely find, you know, there's enough to say that we are a diverse group, right? Um, I have a disability, somebody else may have a disability, you know, so you could actually say that. Well, the catch is when you start talking about um, inclusion or inclusivity, you are really talking about, do you value what I have to say? Do you respect my opinion? Are you willing to incorporate my ideas into the bigger picture? And so to truly make science more inclusive, we have to be willing to say that we're not the smartest all the time in the room, one, but two, that someone else's opinion matters just as much as mine. It may be totally different perspective, but it matters just as much as mine because you never know where the cure is. You never know who's gonna be the one to unlock you know, Pandora's box. And, and save the world of cancer or whatever it may be that we're, you know, we're working on. That could be tucked away in anybody's brain. And so when we are willing to be more inclusive of others, then we bring more ideas to the table and we as a country um, will, will progress a whole lot further. I agree. So what is your favorite thing about working at NASA? My favorite thing about working at NASA is that every single day I go to work, um, whether it's from home or in the factory, I'm putting my footprints in history. That's super exciting. That's so cool. I know. That, that's the part that, you know, no matter what you do, it's about you putting your footprints in history. And each and every person that you work alongside of, we're all putting our footprints in history. And that's pretty amazing for me. Definitely. Well, um, is there anything else that you would like to add? Yes. So you guys are at the ball um, virtually with me and you got to listen to me. But the catch is we also need you to donate. So this is a fundraiser um, for the Adler Planetarium. And so I want you to think long and hard how much you're going to give, not if you're going to give, but how much you're going to give. Um, your donations are extremely important. 
um, on, on keeping the planetarium going. And when we come out of COVID and we can get back to touching and seeing and being, it's gonna be really important that the planetarium is there for future scientists like me and for that, that child that's sitting around dreaming about outer space. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Maddie, you did such an awesome job. These were really great questions, and I, I certainly learned a lot. I'm already a big Renee Horton fan. So. <laughs> so, Maddie, what was your favorite thing about being an intern? I loved my group a lot. I just loved oh. the people I got to meet. I met so many people, and, like, yeah, it was really special. That's good. So you started your network. Yeah. <laughs> You yes. Know. You've started your network. You're going to be able to reach back and say, you'll be able to email me 10 years from now and say, hey, do you remember I interviewed you um, for the virtual ball? And I'll be like, yeah, I remember that because it was the only virtual ball I ever did. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Fingers crossed. But you see what I'm saying? That's how you start your network. Mm -hmm. And you did an amazing job. So thank you for the interview. Thank you so much for letting me interview you. <laughs> Thanks to both of you for, for doing this. I know this will be really awesome for our guests. And um, I know uh, Maddie worked hard on those questions and you did a great job. And yeah. Dilda, your questions, Maddie? Yeah. They were really good. Thank really you. good. Thank you again for joining us, Dr. Horton. Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Lucianne. And thank you, Dr. Horton and Maddie for that wonderful conversation. We are reinventing ourselves this year. We are navigating an uncertain world today so that we can have a certain Adler tomorrow. 2020 is indeed challenging, but we're up to the task. We learned that from Captain Lovell. The Adler Planetarium has brought the universe to Chicago's lakeshore for 90 years. In all those decades, the world around us never stood still. We witnessed the first steps on the moon and stood alongside people who rose up, fought for their rights, and won. We gathered our neighbors under the stars through a Great Depression and a world war. Now we face a new challenge, a once in a century pandemic that has upended our lives and our economy and called on us to reinvent the way we work. When the world pushes us apart, the Adler finds new ways to bring people together, whoever they are and wherever they are. We connect people to the universe and each other, show them that they are part of something much bigger than any of us, and celebrate the difference they can make in science and their community and to people they've never even met everywhere on the planet and beyond. We don't know what the future will look like, but we do know who will be there to build it, to think critically and creatively, to make new discoveries, achieve the impossible, and solve whatever problems come their way. Our world never stops changing. In every moment of inflection, there's a new opportunity to shape it for the better. The Other Planetarium is ready. Are you? As the evening comes to a close, I want to appeal to your generosity and ask that you make a gift to the Adler to support our mission. If you've already done so, thank you. Whether you can give $10 or $10,000, every bit helps us do the type of programming that you've seen tonight. It also helps us bring conversations between astronomers and educators to the world during this digital time. And we're preparing virtual field trips for middle school classes. The platform to give will be open long after tonight's program. And our commitment to our mission will persist forever. On behalf of the entire Adler team, thank you for being a part of tonight. Thank you for supporting us. The museum may be closed, but the sky above is open to all. So on a clear night, step outside and look up. You might see Jupiter or Saturn or Mars or the moon. My family and I will be out there looking up with you. We're on this journey together under the sky we all share. Thank you for being a part of this evening. Keep looking up. Good night.